I'm an assistant professor at Auburn University in special education. Um, I do research on challenging behavior um, assessment and treatment and sexuality and relationship education for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and I have been lucky to work with Dr. Hill and Maria on this grant um, for the last two and a half years. It's been a while. So um, Dr. Hill. Same thing. I am a um, associate research professor, director of the Regional Autism Network, and I have had the pleasure and honor. And on that note, we'll start. Maria, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hill. Well, my name is Maria Gutierrez. I am the family navigator for the Regional Autism Network. We are region number four, and we cover 20 counties. And it has been a privilege and an honor to be working along with Dr. Drew and Dr. Hill on the, during this grant. We are very grateful for ACDD uh, because it provided us you know, with an opportunity for our Hispanic families and our Korean families to have language access. We are so appreciative of the time and commitment from our interpreters. They have been excellent and just I just want to say thank you I hope that uh, all the families have a great time during the holidays I do want to say that I appreciate very much the professionals that have joined us constantly you know during these trainings especially because you are learning about the Latino families and you know the importance of the culture and I know that by attending you are serving better you know our families in the state of Alabama so thank you again Okay, I think on that note, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I have the first part, the kind of academic dry part, so <laughs> I'll start. Why do we teach social skills? We It's part of a lifelong process of learning. The skills we use as a child change as we become an adolescent and as we become an adult. And the thing about um, social skills is that... Um, we change our behaviors to adapt to, to the who we're with. Sometimes even the verbiage, the words we use change. Um, if you were with adults, you say, I'm gonna excuse myself to use the restroom. If you have a child, you might say, it's time to go potty. So really we change how we talk depending on who we're with. And, and, and that's how social skills work. And, um, and social skills are generally um, gauged by the impact or the impressions that other people have on, the, on your skills. Um, so, and we learn about social skills by understanding how people react to our behaviors. Um, all right, there's a social competence, okay? Again, that's how, um, if you can read other people's body language and facial expressions, you can tell how people are reacting to the things you're saying, and that can help you fit in. So as we know, sometimes with our children with disabilities, you really have to work on flashcards even of facial expressions and identifying whether somebody's surprised or happy or sad. Um, so, and social skills, um, competent social skills are important for our peer and family relationships. Um, some, uh, some of our kids learn through observing others. You know, they kind of have that ability to um, learn through observation, but otherwise, and, and we have found with our children with autism, we sometimes, and other disabilities, we need to use direct instruction. Okay, and um, yeah, so if we get to be adolescents and adults and you have poor relationships with others, um, you can end up risk failure in school, okay? Um, involvement with the criminal justice system, uh, mental health issues, anxiety, depression, um, and a relationship and employment issues. Okay, so understanding social skills, becoming socially competent, and being able to read a room basically is important to uh, all those areas. Okay, so generally, this is how we learn. First of all, we learn to pay attention. Okay, little baby learns to pay attention to when a bottle's held up, or food is held up, or mom is laughing, or dad is laughing, or whatever. You learn to pay attention. And then you learn to follow instructions. 
um, like sit down, um, get, hold my hand, those kind of things. Then you learn to imitate others, okay? And sometimes we have to teach this. Um, that's that direct instruction of clap your hands, um, touch your nose, touch your ears, learning to imitate. Then receptive skills is how we listen to others. And that generally we learn what before we learn to talk ourselves. And in between those two, we learn to match and to sort. When you think of how we raise our children, um, those are the things, and that's how toys are marketed a lot of times is to address the uh, matching and sorting and those kind of things. Then we learn our academic skills. We learn our letters, our numbers, adding, subtracting. The last thing that's actually taught generally is social skills. Um, it hasn't had a big priority. So why are they difficult to learn? Um, everybody does things a little bit differently. And um, again, culturally, people do things differently. Um, each family has its own culture as well. And every workplace has its own culture as well. Um, so having come out of the military culture, I had to learn a whole new culture of being in uh, education. So it was it was a challenge to make that transition. And sometimes they're difficult to learn because maybe some people don't want to interact with a lot of people. Maybe they're better with just one person. And you have to be able to listen. You have to be able to take turns. You have to be able to share. You have to be able to understand eye contact. Uh, when is eye contact a little bit too creepy? You know, it's just staring. Or when is eye contact looking at the ground and not making eye contact seeming that you are aloof or you don't want to interact? So understanding the importance of eye contact. And then uh, in social skills, you have to be able to answer questions and respond to others and start conversations and be able to greet new people appropriately. So that's a lot of skills. So is you have to look at social skills like you look at other things. Uh, when we look at academics, does the person know how to do addition with regrouping? Um, or do we need to teach it? It's the same thing with social skills. Does the person, individual, know how to greet others appropriately? If not, we may need to teach it. That's a skill deficit. A performance deficit, they may know how to technically do it, but they lack the practice of doing it with another person. So that's, again, why you have to practice and in a safe environment. Um, so we have to look at also difficulty in demonstrating social skills may be tied to, um, I got this, hold on, maybe tied to, oh, maybe tied to how they're reacting to the situation. Are they getting emotional about it? Okay. Uh, are they wanting to escape the situation? That kind of thing. And then uh, reasons to address social skills. Um, it, it will make it easier for your family if you visit others, okay? If, if your child understands greetings and taking turns and those kind of things, and then it's less stressful for your child, and then and it's less stressful for you, okay? I know, um, I'm just thinking when the first time we got on an airplane with our daughter, we actually went to the airport a couple of times to watch the planes take off, to practice it, um, those kind of things. Okay, we wanna teach skills that help build friendships in social skills groups. That's what peers does, um, which comes out of UCLA. It's the direct instruction of social skills. And here in Auburn, it's offered through Auburn Parks and Recreation. And if you want more information on peers, you're welcome to email us and we'll, we'll send you the flyer. Um, and they do things like they teach you how to trade information with another person. Um, instead of hog, don't be a conversation hog, those kind of things. They teach you how to take turns. Uh, during peers, there's a night where somebody brings their favorite activity 
and they talk about it with another person and then they trade information about it. Um, and you find common if interests. They actually even teach how to use social media. How many times is it appropriate to call somebody and leave a message? That's direct in instruction of those skills. Um, so, and the thing is about peers, P-E-E-R-S, UCLA, it's at UCLA, um, University of California, Los Angeles. If you go to their website, they have role-playing videos. Everything from how to trade information all the way up is how to ask somebody on a date. So, um, so that's the video modeling that they provide. Um, you want to be able to um, teach those skills, give them opportunities to practice those skills, and then also incorporate how, how the schedule is going to change for the holidays, because that can be stressful as well, and provide rewards for following instructions in the natural setting. When they go to their, uh, to their school party, reward um, reward them for waiting their turn to open a gift in the classroom, whatever it is that they're going to be doing, whatever structure is going to be in that environment. You might want to ask your teachers, your therapists, and other providers to help with social skills. Maybe you're going to work on one or two things. Uh, maybe we're going to talk about unwrapping presents, those kind of things. Um, and, and asking for uh, social skills to be added to the IEP, you can do that. And then um, look at holiday specific behaviors and skills for teachers to address. I know we were talking about bolos and we were talking about pinatas earlier today. <laughs> what's the what's the social skill involved with that? And then um, and then specific examples of activities your family will do over the holidays. I know with my I had a student who was flying to the Philippines with her parents and her mom did a social story and it actually had them with their Velcro that where they sat in their seats and you can move them to lining up to get on the plane and finding your seat and all those things. It was, and she lent it to us to read to her daughter as, as part of them getting ready for that holiday activity. Okay. And really quickly, Dr. Hill, um, for our Hispanic parents um, and professionals who maybe are not Hispanic, um, there is a gap in what you know about another culture's holiday activities. So for example, <clears throat> I was like, oh, I know a lot of things. And then we have Maria in our pre-meeting that we do before our presentations. And she was like, oh, don't forget about um, the Posada where you go house to house. Don't forget. And I was like, oh, this is new to me. This is something new. Um, so for our Hispanic families, um, I would not assume that the teachers have any idea about what specific practices you have around the holiday. Not because they don't want to know, they just maybe have never heard of, maybe you in, in the place where you come from have a very specific way that you celebrate the holidays with other people from that area. And so if you let the instructors know, um, <clears throat> and professionals, if you ask families, it can be really helpful because I grew up in a, uh, with a Catholic family, you know, my grandparents are Catholic. So we went to midnight mass. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very specific practice. Not, not even all Catholics go to midnight mass. Um, so again, <clears throat> making sure to talk with providers and talk with families about what their practices are, because you may think you know, um, and you may be surprised by a new practice or something that you've not heard of. Um, and it also allows you to build a relationship with the provider and then also with the family where you know more about each other. Um, and it's just a good, it's a good idea to have those conversations as much as possible um, for, for lots of different reasons, but also to build rapport between families and practitioners. Thank you, Dr. Drew. Um, yeah, we're a tag team today. We're just going to be. <laughs> um, but when when we're looking at types, of, if you're thinking about social skills and what might need to be taught, look about look at these five areas. First of all, survival, teaching, listening, following directions, ignoring distractions, uh, using nice or brave talk, saying to yourself, "I can do this." That's nice or brave talk. 
and then rewarding yourself. You did a great job. Go ahead and get yourself a cookie. Start that self-determination skills. And then, then the second area is interpersonal, being able to share, asking for permission, how to join an activity, waiting your turn, all those things. And then problem solving. How do I ask for help if I can't get the ribbon off of a present? How do I say I'm sorry if I open the wrong present? Uh, if mom makes me sit and wait it out because I opened three presents in a row and didn't wait, how do I how do I react to that? And then um, and then the next one, conflict resolution. What do you do if you're being teased or this is a big one, uh, not being able to lose at a game. So you might have to practice that. Um, understanding, accusing others, like if you're losing at a game, you're accusing other people of teaching. So uh, of of cheating. Sorry, my brain's scrolling for words. <laughs> um, and then what happens if you're left out? And what do you do about peer pressure? And a lot of that is taught through peers, which I'm looking at this and thinking about the peers program. And then re repairing misunderstood communication. Thumbs, some things don't translate straight across, as you know. Um, and then there are some probably um, words or idioms in different languages that might mean something different. Um, so I was just thinking about the idiom tip of the iceberg. For us, that means there's a lot more underneath that we don't know about. So, and that's an idiom. And our world and, and culture is full of idioms. And on that note, um, we're gonna talk about, let's look at social skills. Where does the skill occur or not occur? Um, if we're talking about greeting others, does your um, child greet grandma okay because he or she sees grandma a lot? Um, but strangers is a different, you know, you might have to teach them work, show them pictures of cousins that you're going to see that you haven't seen before. And then looking at teaching skills step by step, just like you would with academics. And look, if your child is a visual learner, you might want to be looking at doing video modeling or social stories. And um, who's involved when, when the individual um, demonstrates the skill to greet others? Who's there and who's not there? So you're, you're looking at the bigger picture. Um, I think this is where I hand it over. Um, no, well, I'll do, you want me to do this one too? Okay. First of all, you're going to teach the skill and how to do it, okay? Then you're going to model it, okay? You're going to model how to open presents. You're going to model how to make a sandwich, all those things. Um, and you're going to have positive examples, which is going to show how to do it, and then negative examples, and they're usually silly, and usually the adult does the negative examples because the kids can get carried away. <laughs> how not to do it. And then you give them feedback. Tell them. Tell them uh, you did this great, but next time remember to sit back down and let the next person have their turn. And then and then praise or reward for when they demonstrate the skill effectively. So, and then you're gonna try to practice it in different environments. So that's kind of the general rule for teaching almost any social skill. And so now, uh, hopefully I'll be able to do this. Peer modeling is point out how other children are behaving. I know we use peer models a lot in what we do. We generally teach the peer models how to be peer models, to not tease, to, to reward good behavior in, um, in, the, in the child. Um, peers can do that and not tease them if they're doing something different or not appropriate um, and ignoring Poor behavior. Like if, if the child doesn't want to line up and climbs under the desk, the peers just pretty much ignore it or coach the child to come with them because they're going out to recess or whatever. But um, the thing is, peer models are trained or taught how to be good models for our children who are having some behavior challenges. So now I am going to stop the share and I'm going to show these videos, hopefully. There's lots of stuff in the chat I see, but because I'm doing the PowerPoint, I haven't been able to see the chat. Um, um, leave the questions for the end, Dr. Hill. Okay. And Patricia, we're sad too. 
we're really sad. So I want you to know we're sad as well. Okay, so this one is called Let's Open Presents. And it's a, it's a, um, you'll have to share your I, I am, I'm working on it. I'm okay. just, I'm a little, you're doing uh, great. I want to make sure I got the right one. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Hello, my name is Nathan. Today, we're going to learn how to open presents. Wow, 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 wow. We wait with calm hands and feet for our turn to open presents. It's time to open presents. Present. Presents. If there's a card, we open and read the card first. Then we can open the gifts. If we need help, we can just ask. Can you help me, please? Help me, please. Once it's open, we always say thank you to the person who gave it. First, we look in their eyes, smile, and then say thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Whatever gift you get, it's still good to look in their eyes, smile, and say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you really love the gift, you can say, I love it. I love it. And I love it. Then we put the gift to the side gently. We can open the next gift. We open all the gifts first. Then we can play with our favorite. <laughs> But the best part about presents is when you give a present to someone else. Thank you. Lucy! Japanese tea! Wait, wait, wait. That was so kind. You are a kind person. Thank you for joining us. And please subscribe to our channel. Please. Say thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs> You're dealing with me here. <laughs> I don't want socks. <laughs> Good. Oh, I will get. Happy celebrating to all of you from Mighty Nightly. All right, I don't know where it went. It's going to keep playing. Um, we had to have something like this for our last I don't know where it went. That's the thing, is I can't find it. In Charter Street, if you mute yourself, you give yourself some time, and I can talk. I am going to mute myself and let you continue, OK? okay. Southern. Uh, there we go. So um, <clears throat> that was a video model of how to teach your child or one way of teaching your child how to open presents. Now, this is highly dependent on your family. So in some families, the children open gifts first. In some families, <clears throat> you take turns going around in a circle. So you would need to make your own specific to your family and the practices that your family uses. <laughs> if you notice, they said, if you have a card, then you open the card first and you read the card and then you open your present. Now, again, that's very family dependent. Some families, maybe that isn't how you would do it. Um, maybe you would have them open the card and give it to a parent to read rather than opening the card themselves and reading it, depending on their reading level, depending on their attention span. Um, so you would teach them the way that you want um, the uh, present opening to go. Also, I like how they talked about giving presents. So um, I worked with a young man with autism and we went to a birthday party once um, and he did not understand that not all the presents were for him. That was really hard for him. He did not, he did not understand that, and not even that not all the presents were him for him. None of the presents were for him because it was someone else's birthday. So that was really hard for him. And so before we went to the next birthday, we practiced. Um, but again, with Christmas, there's also a lot going on, right? Um, your schedule is disrupted. You're probably at someone else's house or someone is at your house. Um, so things are different. So practicing in advance and 
being prepared. So maybe wrapping up the um, one of your child's own toys that um, I don't know if y'all do this, but I have friends that do this. They rotate toys out. So you put some toys away for a while and then you bring them back out and it's sort of like they're new toys again, um, even though they're not new. So you could take some of those toys and wrap them and practice with your child how to open the gift, how to wait their turn. So maybe they open one and then their sibling opens one and then they open one. Um, Cause again, turn taking maybe part of your Christmas um, routine, opening presents routine. Um, so that is something to um, consider when you are teaching these skills is what is the expectation in your family or the family that you will be visiting for the holidays, because every family does things differently. Um, this could also look like calling ahead, calling the person if you've never been to their house around Christmas and say, hey, do you do a certain thing? How does that work? You know, tell me, tell me what that looks like. What do you expect of my child? Um, and you can do that. Um, Y'all will be much better at it than me because I'm very direct. Um, Y'all will be much better at kind of managing that conversation. Um, but it's definitely something to think about. Um, you can also use story-based interventions, um, which we, I don't know how we're looking on time. Um, we may want to have that one at the end. Um, and then there's let's also- go ahead, Let's go ahead and do that one. And then we okay. have a lot more links. So I figured out that these links are in Chrome and my default is Safari. So when I tried to exit out, I couldn't find it because it was in Chrome. So we're all <laughs> learning. All but learning. I love that you told me to mute myself because it gave me a chance to take a deep breath and go, okay. Yeah. Yes. Behavioral uh, interventions. I do know something about that. Yes. <laughs> and then you'll need to share your... I will. I'm, I'm getting there. There you go. I'm okay. just a little slower. Can you see it? The Christmas Social Story Collection from the Sensory Corner. The Christmas Season and what to expect. Social story number two. Christmas is a holiday that is in December. There are many activities that families like to do at Christmas. Some people hang up wreaths on their door. Some people decorate their houses with colored lights or decorations. Some families decorate the inside of their homes with other decorations. This is called decorating and it makes our house look nice. Some families put decorations, lights, and ornaments on a Christmas tree. We will put presents under our tree until it is time to open them. We may hang our stockings by the fireplace or somewhere special if we do not have a fireplace. On Christmas morning, there will be surprises in my stocking. My school will be closed before and after Christmas to spend time with my family. On Christmas Eve, families get together with each other to go to church or eat. Santa is visiting that night and he will leave presents under the tree and in my stocking. Some families leave cookies and milk for Santa to eat and drink while he is there. After waking up on Christmas morning, many people open their presents with their family. My family will tell me when it is time to open my presents. I am learning about what to expect during Christmas. If you enjoyed this social story, please subscribe to our channel so you get notifications of others just like this. All right, let me see if I can get out of this now. Change looks and feels different. And also oh, there's changes. The no, seed. No, I'm out of it. I, I figured it out. Yay! New skill unlocked. It was because it defaulted to Chrome. <laughs> All right. So um, so yeah, so you want to practice um doing each of these things you saw that there was a whole list of things about the kind of things that happen during the holidays and um some are culturally specific some are regionally specific so, so um so just to think about that um you want to role play like maria was talking about using the, the pinata or how to make food 
and then use stories to teach. There's lots of children's books and, and things out there that you can use to teach some, some of these holiday specific skills. And now I'm going to hand it over to Christine and Maria. And if you remember from our previous presentation about shared book reading, right, you now have some strategies of how to um, get with your child and make book reading fun. And that is another way. It's sort of like a key that unlocks a door. So once you can read a book with your child, then your child can access more information from books. So we call that a pivotal skill or a behavioral cusp. So shared book reading or being able to get information from books really opens the door for a lot of new information. Um, really quickly, um, we have some things in the chat that it's a great idea to put cards on the presents. Yep, you can put a card. You could even put, um, Dr. Hill had this idea that she'd seen online, um, a picture of your child and a picture of everyone else. So, you know, on the, the presents that are for your child, they have their picture. And then for their siblings, they would have a picture if they can't read or if um, I know when I label presents, my writing is not always as clear. It's not typed out, right? It's handwritten. Um, and so people might have trouble even reading the handwritten labels. So a picture could be a good way to note uh, or a card uh, of whose present is whose. Um, also, someone said that um, that they call ahead, like a week before the event, and remind them um, about uh, each one of my children's needs, um, and they thank me and say they feel more prepared. Absolutely. I think, and um, I can speak, again, as someone who does not have a child, um, I always want to get it right when I'm with other people's children. Um, I wanna know what the rules are so that I can help the parent enforce those rules, right? Keep it consistent. So it helps me to feel less worried when someone will tell me, hey, we don't allow them to do blah. Hey, we always hold hands when we cross the street. Hey, and once I know those rules, man, I am the best. I'm like an extra parent just ready. I'm like, what are the rules I'm gonna help? Um, so it does make people feel relieved to know um, what the rules are, what the needs are, um, particularly if you're visiting someone that maybe you only see once a year and they don't know, um, they ha don't have that experience. So um, yes, that's a great idea. Um, oh, we've been doing the reading together and all my kids love it. Oh, that is so exciting. Dr. Hinton will be so pleased to hear about that. Um, yeah, so this is just, again, these skills kind of build on each other, right? If we get the book reading down, that means we can read about holidays. That means we can read about, you know, any situation because there are a lot of really good children's books um, that talk about a lot of different things. So um, that is awesome. I'm so glad to hear that. Also, okay. You know, they talk about taking the perspective of others. So sometimes that's helpful to teach that. How yeah. does the other person feel? Yep. And so um, short holiday stories can be used in a lot of different ways. So remember in our shared book reading, you know, asking about what someone's doing, asking about what someone's feeling, um, you know, uh, you can ask even, you know, who who's important in this picture? Um, what what are they saying? Um, why are they doing what they're doing? Right. So looking at a child's face in a social story where they're excited and saying, why are they excited? Because they're opening a present. That's right. Opening a present is exciting. Um, what would happen if they did that? What would happen if they did this? Um, you know, how would they feel? How do you feel? Um, these are all great questions you can address through shared reading and specifically about holiday situations. Um, I think for a lot of everyone, actually, I'm not even going to say this is a kid thing, um, getting a gift that isn't what you wanted mm -hmm. or getting a gift that isn't um, a preferred item. So again, in the example video, the little girl got socks. Now, for me, at my big age of 36, I would love to get like cashmere, fancy, warm socks, right? Um, not everyone feels that way though. So also another situation is, you know, to think about is how do they handle when they get a present they don't like? Um, saying thank you, you don't have to say you love the gift, right? Because some of our young people with autism, uh, lying is not okay. 
they do not want to lie. And so you're not lying, you're saying thank you. You're not saying I love it. If you don't love it, you're just saying thank you. So that can be a really helpful way to think about it as well. Okay. All right, now for your stories, you want to make it your own. So the social story that we just watched might not work for your situation. Maybe, you know, you don't do some of the practices that they are talking about, but you can make your own as simply as what I've done here. When we go over to grandma and grandpa's house for Christmas, we will have so much fun. First, we will eat dinner. Then we will have some candy. Then we will take turns opening presents. We will wait while each person opens their gift. Then it will be my turn. I will unwrap the present. I will say thank you to the person who gave me the gift. I can play games with my cousins for the rest of the night. So I've written it out such that the, the child knows the expectations of each activity and knows what order the activities are going in. So that's another reason to call ahead, right? Because in some families, you open presents first and then you have a big meal. In some families, you eat first and then you open presents. What we don't want is for your child to run in, see the presents and start opening them when that is not what is supposed to be happening in the routine. All right. Now, another way to help with, see, this would be a good picture to teach. How is she feeling? How is she feeling about the present that she's opening, right? She's excited. Um, so breaking down each step uh, in any activity. So again, maybe the expectation at your um, parents' house is that the children set the table. Maybe the expectation is that you string corn and cranberries on long strings so that you can hang them up. Um, I had never done that until I moved to Oregon. That's a thing they do there, right? Every culture is different. Um, what are the expectations for having visitors at your home or visiting others? Um, and then uh, a specific example that Maria provided was making bolos and passing them out. So Maria, do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Sure. So like, you know, sometimes how in our culture, when we are hosting an event, especially during the holidays or during this uh, Christmas time, families get together and, you know, you are gonna be passing bolos, which are candy goodie bags. And, you know, we involve all the members of the families, you know, we're gonna, okay, you're gonna be in charge of putting the candies, you will be putting the toys. And some of these goodie bags might be extra special for certain individuals, you know, because we know that maybe uh, one of the cousins cannot have certain, certain candies. So, you are going to be making some exception, exceptions. And sometimes it's even important to share these expectations and these needs with the family members so that you have, you know, these goodie bags, you know, that uh, that you're going to be passing, you know, that are going to be only for certain people because of their special needs. And sometimes families feel the need to share that, you know, well, my kids do not eat candy. You know, they, they have... Food, a food allergy. So then you have to be changing and looking into other ways to include those children, but also making them feel uh, welcoming and included, you know, getting an, a different item than rather than receiving the candies, but maybe getting a special toy. Uh, and I want everyone to know that before the presentation started, Maria let us know that the, the bolos used to just be a little orange and some sugar cane and some peanuts. And then nowadays they have all of these things in them. So um, I made fun of her a little bit about that. So <laughs> uh, I think we're okay because we talked about this one, um, Doris, and we maybe can come back to it. I wanted to just say about this video, if, you, if we don't come back to it, it teaches, it talks about how to make your own social stories. And the, it's a woman and a gentleman who both have um, kids on the spectrum. And he talks about how his son did that exact same thing. He opened every present under the tree. And so now he puts a picture of each child's uh, on, 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 their, on each of their presents so they know. Um, but it, it talks, and he has a website too. I'm not promoting websites. 
but um, where you can you can print pages for free and you can you know make your own social stories. So anyway, this is like a video modeling for parents. So you can see how parents can make a social story. So we might come back to that one because it's a little bit longer. And Maria will add that to the email when she sends out the PowerPoint slides. Um, and then, you know, there's a, a list at the end of this presentation of different websites you can go to. I was amazed. Let me tell you, I was amazed when I started. I said, OK, I'll find social stories. I'll YouTube it and I'll find ones that are appropriate for the holiday. There are tons out there. So if you're looking for a specific social story, you can Google um, setting the table, um, eating at the table, um, taking turns. Oh, you saw the one already about opening presents. So there's a, there's a lot of video models out there for your kids. Um, the one that we've skipped is, is really a video model for parents to learn how to make those stories for their kids. Go ahead, Maria. Okay. So, uh, we need to talk about traditions where we know that in our culture, Traditions are big, okay? So for the professionals that are joining us today, which I, once again, I appreciate your time, is uh, we want to share with you why it's so important for Hispanic and Latino families to keep the traditions, okay? Well, first of all, when you come to live in the U.S., many families, they seek to preserve the traditions that they celebrated in their home country you know, whichever traditions they are. And it's so important for us, for those families to pass that to the younger generations so mm -hmm. that it provides some benefits. It provides them with a part of what is part of their cultural identity. First of all, Hispanic traditions, they help us to be connected to our roots. You know, it's part of my identity and it makes me part of a larger community. Also, it allows the parents to teach the children the differences between what the life is in the U.S. and what it is from the country that you are coming from. And through traditions, we help to our younger people to understand the older, the older generations, you know, why grandma, grandpa, and that auntie that never got married, you know, act the way they act. Mm -hmm. And also it provides us with a way to have empathy to others within that community. So in the Hispanic community, if you just don't know by now, you know, we have a lot of traditions, a lot of traditions that might be different from where you're coming from. We start, I was sharing with Dr. Hill and Dr. Drew that Hispanics, we start celebrating Christmas holidays from the beginning of, of December. You know, because you are many of these traditions are tied up to re, to religious connections. So you might start having an arbolito de Navidad, which is a Christmas tree. You know, you might have a nativity scene. You know, or we call it pesebre, which has the baby Jesus and their figures. You know, that people put under the Christmas tree. And you know, and like Dr. Drew mentioned before, you know, people might have certain traditions like are connected to uh, religious beliefs going to a midnight mass, you know, during Christmas time, or there are special novenas and prayers that you say during the, during this season, during the holiday season. So for families, you know, Hispanic families, traditions are big, and we are going to try to uh, preserve it. And, you know, you join family, friends, neighbors, and if you are a Hispanic family that live in a in a neighborhood where you have different people from different nationalities, you invite them over. So the more the merrier, you know, it involves a lot of food, a lot of drinking, dancing, and eating. And this takes time preparing, being prepared for all these events. And it might start from five o'clock until midnight, one o'clock, and it will go until way late uh, on the hours during the morning. And depending on each family, you know, like we said, that those traditions are going to be different. Uh, and really quickly, um, to help to help white people understand how long the party is going to be, you can tell them to treat it like a tailgate for a football game. You show up before, 
you stay the whole time, and then you stay after. So white people do have parties like this, but we just have them for football. So, so <laughs> cultural, cultural meeting there. <laughs> good point. And along with all those traditions, now as families, we have to think about what else does it come along with that? Well, loud noises, loud music, big crowds, bright lights, and those things can be overwhelming for our children. So as parents and guardians and professionals, we need to learn how to help our children have a smooth transition and be ready to join, but be also ready to be dismissed and to take a step back and go into a safe place when they need to have that kind of a break moment uh, for them to regain composure and to join the body later on. The other thing to think about is, again, a lot of our, our um, kiddos with disabilities, they end up with very specific routines, right? They wake up in the morning, they get on the bus, they go to school, they come home and they get used to that. And that is really helpful. All of that gets blown to bits over the holiday. They're not in school. They're not riding the bus. They're not seeing the same people. They're going to other people's houses, right? They don't have the same bedtime routine. They don't have the same bath routine. So for a lot of our kids, that causes a lot of stress if they're not prepared. Um, when Maria was talking about a separate place. So um, the bedroom where everybody throws their purses on the bed, right? That could be the separate place for the child. You can lay a mat on the floor or wherever and have them lie down and get them to you know, sleep potentially or to even nap. Um, but again, thinking ahead, noticing your child, right? When they start to look like some kids, when they get tired, they do the bobblehead <laughs> thing where they're just like, you can tell they are about to fall asleep, right? So paying attention to that, getting them somewhere quiet and calm. And then when they're ready to rejoin, you know, or you can rejoin. Um, so just thinking ahead about those spaces and asking people about those spaces before you get there. Do we have any more suggestions in the chat? I know there were some good ones about shared reading. And... Uh, not yeah. right now. Okay. Uh, one more back. I think Maria hasn't looked at that one yet. There you go. All right, go ahead, Maria. Okay, so we talk about uh, establishing the rules and how do I, how long do I sit at the table when the family is eating together? Okay, uh, I know that uh, personally for my family, we made this up, this rule, and each family is different, and you had to apply it to your family if you feel that is something that will be beneficial. But for us, it was that, you know, you do not, you do not get up from the table until, you know, half of the family members have finished with their meals. And so that way you're providing and setting up like a rule, okay? Like if we were five, you know, well, three need to finish, you know, before everybody get, before some of the people get to be excused from the table. So it's just try to think about, you know, those times where you could um, making us a rule and letting them know about the rule ahead of time. You know, that is so important that you're not gonna be making new rules as you're going. Um, Think before, during, and after visit meals and church. Right now, good that with the uh, aid of technology, some families could access church services online. You know, so this is an option if you know that this is going to be a very overwhelming environment for your child. Well, guess what? You could join online and say, you know, we're going to go to the service and, att and, and attend it via line and we'll be fine. And later on, we'll join the celebration for a little bit. You know, be mindful that when you tell your child, we'll be there for 45 minutes, you'll be ready to leave the party for 45 minutes and not wanting to extend it until two hours. Because then more likely you might have a meltdown or mm -hmm. a problem. Provi like Dr. Drew mentioned, you know, provide a safe place for the child to take a break and if they need to be removed from that situation. So this is about to be thinking a lot before the event is happening. So it's a, to do a lot of prompting and a lot of planning, but in the end, it will help you have a smooth and nice transition during the holidays. 
The other thing I have here is the safe word. So those of you who um, maybe you have a child who you can tell when they start getting upset. Some kids you're like, whoa, that came out of nowhere. Some kids you're like, oh, oh, that's a sign, right? They start jiggling their leg. They start kind of whining. They start, you know, whatever their warning signs are, right? And what you can do is if you have someone there with you, it could be a partner, um, a husband, a wife, a, you know, support person, a, a tia, you know, an auntie, uncle. And once you have that safe word, you know, cinnamon. Uh, oatmeal, whatever it is, right? Um, and you look at each other, one of you takes the child and the other stays with the rest of the children or stays with the group, whatever it is. So think about um, a lot of churches have viewing rooms for um, people with young children. And so maybe when you say cinnamon, one of you takes the child and goes into the viewing room and then the other stays with the rest of the children. Okay. So that way it doesn't have to be a do you go? Do I go? Who's going? Let's figure it out. If the kid is already upset, you need to be ready to go. So having that decided before you get there can be really helpful. And again, reduce your stress because you're not worried about who's going to go, who's going to take, who's going to stay with the kids, da, da, da. It's already, already, it's already very planned out. So again, just something to think about. Um, Maria, do you want to do this one or you want me to do this one? I'll do this one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, what can you do? What can you do proactively so that it will help you? Make a visual calendar. Make a calendar, get a, a big calendar and put a big star or put something on the day that you're going to host, that you're going to be going to, uh, to, the, uh, to the Christmas party. And so that you make a visual for your child, letting them know you know, that this is the days, how many days before we go and visit grandma, before we go and visit our auntie, and we're going to celebrate as a family. So that you give them, you're giving them time to prepare. And don't just make the calendar visual with the star, you know, but every day, go and say like, a, how many more days do we have before we go and visit grandma? Okay, let's count them and just refresh their memory about what is going to happen, you know, what, how we're going to be doing things so that you are preparing them, okay? Then plan what to wear. For us, the holidays, we want to go all dress up, you know, we make this special hairs on the little girls that all of a sudden, you know, their eyes are all stretched, the hair is all stretched out that, you know, that is so uncomfortable. We buy them shoes. And sometimes this is just a recipe for disaster because they are wearing this kind of clothing that it has is itchy for them. You know, the, the shoes that are brand new and they're not comfortable. So plan on the clothing. What am I going to, what is my child going to wear? Okay. Nowadays, there are so many new clothing that are made of soft fabric you know that they look that they have prints and looks like you look like you're wearing a tuxedo so just plan and look and see what is comfortable for your child you know create a photo album of of the relatives that are coming who's coming you know it might be that auntie that your child has not seen in five in five years and they have no recollection of them but you know them that they're coming and this auntie, she's very loving and she loves to hug and kiss everybody and give them a squish and, you know, pinch their cheeks. And your child does not like that. So start preparing your relative members and say like, ah, oh, you know, Martha likes to do high fives, okay? She likes to do, um, you know, she will only say hello, you know, or she likes to do side hugs. So, Preparing your relatives and helping your child will make will help you make this holiday better for everybody. So putting you know pictures of the people that might be coming and letting them know, oh, this is Uncle John. Uncle John lives in uh, Oregon. Remember, he has you know a little doggy, so that if there are opportunities for them to engage later on in conversation. Now. Involve your child in the process of decorating, okay? When we decorate our homes, you know, we like to put the Christmas tree, the nativity set, and sometimes we do not make rules. And so if we do not make the rules, well, then everybody's going to feel, 
you know, especially children that are, if you are putting something, putting up something new, they feel like, oh, well, if this is not off limits, then that means that I could go and play with it. So as you start decorating, start making rules as you go. Like, uh, remember, we're putting all these nativity set right here, and this is not for touching. We only see them with our eyes. Prepare the family for, um, prepare the family, including the physical environment, okay? What is it going to happen in, in the, during the celebration? What are we going to do that it might be difficult for somebody, okay? Do I need to maybe uh, not have so many bright lights, okay? Uh, the food that, my, that am I going to be cooking, you know? Is it going to be a lot of, aromas, spices that is going to be leaving an environment, you know, that might be irritated for somebody, you know, what can I do so that I could change the environment so that I could make it comfortable for that person with those needs? And also, you know, what can I do? I know we know that we are going to be eating tamales, pozole, you know, all those goodies that are so good at comfort food, but Maybe your child does not eat tamales. Maybe your child doesn't drink punch, okay? So what are you? What can you do if you're coming to a, a birthday, uh, to a celebration? Or maybe you could bring your own dish, you know, a dish that your child will enjoy. Believe it or not, there's nothing wrong if you bring macaroni and cheese to a Mexican celebration, okay? To a Latino celebration during the holidays. Something that you will feel that your child could eat and um, that he will be fine, you know. Uh, we we want our kids to feel comfortable and we want our families to have fun. But we need to be thinking about all these items ahead of time and prepare in order for us to have a successful and a nice time with our friends and relatives. Another thing to think about is that some foods like tamales, right? They take so much work to make them that most people only have them once a year. So it could be that your child has never even tried a tamale because they haven't had the opportunity, right? And so you could also help encourage them to try little bites. Um, and then if they don't like it, that's okay, right? Making that okay but encouraging them to just try. Because again, these are many of them seasonal foods that they may not have the opportunity to try other times, but bringing your own food. The fastest way to a meltdown is for a child to be tired, overstimulated, and hungry. That is a recipe for disaster. <laughs> so if we can take care of hungry, we're already doing better than we were doing before. If we can take care of tired by having them take a nap or do something else, if we can take care of overstimulated by see the little baby with the headphones, right? Um, then we are much less likely to run into a meltdown. So in order for us to continue being proactive, you know, we had to help our children to have, uh, to keep their routine as much as possible, okay? I know that if your child is that kind of child that goes to bed by 10, well, you excuse yourself because if you want to stay until one or two o'clock, you know, then like Dr. Drew said, you know, is this is going to be a recipe for disaster, you know? So trying to keep the routine as much as possible will help to and ensure to have a, a, a nice time celebrating. And like we mentioned before, you know, think about sensory, okay? The lights, the, the cooking, the sounds, what can I do to help my child? And, you know, especially for those children that really are, uh, you know, that sensory, that smelling, you know, that smells are is something that will irritate them. Well, what can I do? Well, maybe we could set up a little table where the kids will eat, you know, not so close to the kitchen. And that way, you know, the aromas will not be as strong. And what can I bring to that event that will help calm my child? Okay. Nobody knows your child better than you do, okay? So do they have a special toy? Do I have a weighted blanket, okay? Do they have any toys that he could use while he is, you know, if he's getting overwhelmed, okay? So those are things to be thinking about and see, okay, I need to pack them on the bag that we need to bring and we do not forget this bag. Or well, let's put that bag once it's been packed, let's put it in the car so that we don't forget it, okay? 
And so practicing, uh, can you go back Dr. Drew? One, one more. Okay, thank you. So taking pictures. We all are about social media. We are crazy going about social media and putting everything out there. And for that, sometimes we're looking for the perfect family picture. Well, there is none, okay? And sometimes the most beautiful family pictures are those that happen natural. But obviously, none of us want to have a picture of a child having a meltdown and crying and just showing that they are in pain and they are not enjoying the moment. So what can you do? Well, practice with your child how to take pictures. Go in front of the mirror and say, how do we smile when we are gonna be taking a picture as a family, okay? Because sometimes we don't want to have that awkward smile like, or, or blinking, you know? Practice that you're gonna be counting to three. And when you count to three, then we try to keep our eyes open, okay? And how to, how to pose, okay? Help your child with those, with those, um, with, with those interventions and help them, you know, not feel as overwhelmed. So if traveling is gonna be involved, practice in advance, especially when Dr. Hill was mentioning, you know, if a family is gonna be going and traveling, you know, by plane, maybe it's a good idea to go and drive by the airport and say like, a, we're gonna be getting on a plane, okay? Go and Google and, and look up for some videos where it could show you what happens when you get on the plane, what is expected. Okay, uh, my family and I, we just came back from, from Mexico and uh, on one of our leg flights, uh, there was a family that brought uh, two children and they were sitting behind us. And one of the children was probably as young as three years old. And you know, three years old, when they're sitting, their legs don't bend, you know, at the knee level, you know, they're sticking like that. And so they're hitting, they were hitting my seat. I knew better that this was nothing that I could do. I remember when my own children were that young. So I was just sympathetic, okay? So if you're gonna be traveling, maybe you could um, request a seat where, you know, you could sit on, on the last row and maybe in front, of, in front of your child, you know, one of the family members could sit. So that is not a total stranger. So just to have these things in mind. And like uh, we mentioned, you know, when you are visiting somebody, uh, and or people are coming and visiting you, especially if the cousins are coming, you know, or your friends and neighbors are coming. If your child has his toys and there are some toys that are very special to him, maybe that is the good time to put those toys away and have some toys, some toys that that he will feel comfortable sharing with others, right? Well, that where people are there visiting. Or, you know, uh also letting him choose which toys are okay for people to touch. Because we know that children, you know, they form attachments to, to their toys and they might not want anybody to go and break up their Lego structure that it took them a week to make up. So uh, all these are, you know, some of points that will help families that hopefully the holidays will not be stressful for your children and for you. So what to do if you need to leave? So you need to have an emergency exit plan, okay? You need to be realistic, okay? How long the activities are gonna take and how long can your child really participate, okay? There is nothing wrong at having an emergency exit plan, okay? You need to think about like, a, can my child handle it uh, three hours? Can we only stay for half an hour, okay? Can we go at all or not, okay? Be mindful of, about your own personal situation and you make that decision as a family. But if you need to leave, like we mentioned, okay? You need to have a, an exit word, okay? A word that you and your family member that is gonna be going with you, that person that is gonna be uh, joining you, knows that the moment that you said, you know already what the exit plan is gonna look like, okay? So maybe, you know, you might you might be the only one living with the child and the rest will get to enjoy it, you know? Or we're living all as a family. 
So whatever that is, just make sure that, you know, the adults know what the emergency exit plan looks like. Uh, pick up your bottles. Not every single thing that your child is doing wrong is, is a matter for you to dedicate your whole attention and to make it big, okay? Sometimes it's better just to pretend that you didn't see it, okay? Uh, have this, the signal for uh, to escape, okay? Like Dr. Drew says, cinnamon, okay? Pick up a word that only you and the other adult know the meaning of it, okay? Um, and also try to get people in your team. Okay, like if you know that your cousin Martha, she is so good with your child and your child loves her, then talk to Martha ahead of time and say, hey, if you see me that I'm not done with my dinner and the food is so delicious, you know, but you see that my child is really having a, is done, can you jump in and help me, you know? So try to have some people in your network, you know, that will be coming. The other thing to remember, right? How long does it take to say goodbye at a Hispanic event? <laughs> Two hours, time. three hours, right? You start your goodbyes. You have to say goodbye to every individual person. It is hugs. It is making plans. It is, oh, you forgot your leftovers. We're going to make you a plate. Then they make you a plate. Then you're at the door. Then you forgot your purse. Then you're back to the room with the purses. Then you're back out with your leftovers. So that's the other reason for the emergency plan. Take your time because you've got the other person, four or more, exactly, exactly, Patricia, yes. So when you say the emergency word, either you or someone else in your party takes the child and goes to the car, for example. Then you can do your long goodbye without having to hear your child screaming the whole time, right? Because they're having a meltdown. So once they're in the car, that's where all their comfort items can be. They can have the iPad and watch something. They can lay down, all of that. And that is going on. And then you can do the goodbye and you don't have to rush out, right? So again, that tag team, having two people or more would be better to have, remove the child, the child is safe, and you can continue with the tradition and you don't have to run out the door, right? Which could be seen as rude by older generations. Um, and so again, just thinking ahead that way, you know, how long does that really take? Four hours, right? And if your child is having a meltdown the whole time, it's gonna be really hard and they probably will have trouble coming out of the meltdown. Something uh, that I, oh, sorry, can I just mention something else, yeah. Dr. Drew? Mm -hmm. uh, something that I, uh, can you go back? Something that I will say is that sometimes as parents, our first instinct, instinct is to, uh, to use that moment when they're having a meltdown to educate others. Believe me, that's not the right moment, okay? So you want to be proactive. And I'll have to say that if this is, if you had to use your emergency exit plan, be gentle with yourself and be kind to your child, okay? There is nothing worse for a child that they feel when everybody's looking at them, them and staring them at them and they're co making comments, okay? That people feel awkward. So be kind to yourself and gentle to yourself, but also to your child and to the rest of the family. Because, you know, these things are going to happen and sometimes it's okay to say no, you know? Thank you for the invitation. This year, we're planning to stay Lucky is going to be just as a family. And don't feel bad if you have to create new traditions. Each family is entitled to create their own traditions, whatever they are, okay? I remember for my family, when my children were younger, and it was difficult to keep everybody online and to keep everybody together at the reach of the hand, okay? I would just put them on the car and said, Guess what? We're going to go and see all the houses decorated. And I will drive around the neighborhoods that I know that had the prettiest houses and start talking like, oh, look what they have. And, you know, that was our tradition that we did for a lot of years. So there is nothing wrong with creating new traditions that are meaningful to your family. And, you know, like I said, give yourself some break because you also need to have some time to uh, 
be gracious to you because for everything that is happening during the holidays. The holidays are going to be hard for our children, but we hope that they will enjoy it. The other thing here. Okay, so I'm going to give you some, um, it, this is very white lady advice or not advice, but white lady input. So feel free to tell me I'm being ridiculous. But the other thing to consider, right? Most families expect hugs, kisses, eye contact. Some families even expect for children to sit on laps, right? And to be physically close to the family members. Not every child wants that. This is also something that's different with generations. So older folks may expect children to give a kiss and a hug, even if they don't know them, right? So something that we are finding with child abuse is that teaching children to just hug or kiss an adult that they don't know could actually um, hurt them in the long run because then any adult could tell them to kiss and hug them and the child has not been taught that it's okay to say no or it's okay not to hug and kiss someone you don't want to hug and kiss. So when we see family, that could be another way, another thing to prepare them for, right? Um, Maria's example, little Johnny. Little Johnny, he will give you a high five, but he does not like hugs, right? Um, little Johnny will give you a thumbs up, but he does not like kisses, right? And so I think that is another educational conversation that can happen before you go, as opposed to standing there and Tia is saying, oh, Bessie thumbs, right? That is not the time to have that. I mean, you can, right? You can say he doesn't do kisses. That's fine, but it'll be a lot less upsetting or startling to the other person if you tell them in advance, right? That what they can expect is little Johnny will wave, give a thumbs up, give a high five, give a side hug, um, but please don't kiss their face, you know, whatever the situation is. Um, because a lot of us with young children with disabilities, a kiss on the face is just asking for that person to get punched. <laughs> Right. And we don't want that as a rough way to start a family function. <laughs> if you walk in and someone with a mustache kisses your child and they have a sensory reaction to the rough mustache, right? And their impulse is to punch or to hit or to push, right? So, again, thinking ahead and also empowering your child to say, no, thank you, high five. No, thank you. Thumbs up. No, thank you. Right. So again, you can practice that with your child. And, and I, again, this is some white lady things I'm saying. If you're like, nope, Dr. Drew, in my family, we hug and my kid has to get used to it. That's totally fine too. But just something to consider, especially if you want to set your child up for success. Because if the first thing that happens when they show up is a bunch of strangers touch them, and a bunch of strangers are in their face and touch their face with their mouth, you might, you might have to use your emergency word faster <laughs> than you thought you were going to, because that can be really overwhelming um, for children, especially children with disabilities. Okay, I said my white lady part. All right. <laughs> so now we have some scenarios that we're gonna go over and we're gonna ask y'all for your input. Um, and Maria, do you want to stop the recording so people can speak out loud or do we want to have it in the chat? We could, uh, have it in the chat if you want to. Sure. Okay. So here's our scenario. You are going over to your aunt's home. She has many small breakable objects in her home. And you know that she wants all of the children to make bolsas or bolos and other crafts. So we've got two things happening. One, lots of breakables. 
Two, she has a specific activity she wants the children to do. So what can you do to set your child up for success before you go over? So I want y'all to think about the examples that we've given and maybe things you have already done to set your child up for success and go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, while you're, okay, here we go. So while you're putting things in the chat, um, some people said these are good recommendations. I'm so glad that you like them. Some people are saying that, you know, respecting the child's boundaries is a new thing to think about. And of course it's new and we are all learning. So I'm glad that that was helpful, a helpful suggestion. Um, some funny emergency words. Okay, so you want to think about words that you wouldn't say normally in conversation. So uh, anything from, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm thinking like my, my because I said cinnamon, now I'm thinking of spices, but like, you know, it could be oak tree, could be, um, you know, stained glass could be, um, pineapple could be, um, you know, um, Best Buy <laughs> could be anything, um, as long you could even say 911, right? It could even be something that maybe other people know is something is weird, but you, it's your signal, right? So 911 code red, um, you know, and you can even say code yellow, which means like, ooh, ooh, we're getting close. And then we could have code red for like, time to go, right? Um, yes, so I'm, I'm, I'll am i have to come up with some other, you know, or firecrackers, <laughs> fireworks, right? Like we're about to have fireworks here, right? Um, so I'm sure that uh, y'all can come up with a specific one for you. It could even be an inside joke, right? Um, so maybe you, the last time you were at Build-A-Bear, it was a disaster. And so then you say, Build-A-Bear, which is code for, it's about to be a disaster. <laughs> so, um, okay. So it says, uh, to explain before the visit, very good. Um, Decide what is the most important to to have to have to do to do um, um, or don't participate. Yeah. Um, and then I don't know what the last one means, Patricia. I'm so sorry. My English is limited. Hakuna matata. That's the word. Oh, hakuna matata. Yes. <laughs> that's a perfect. That's a perfect phrase. Yes. So explaining before the visit. Now, this can go two ways. You can explain to the aunt, hey, those breakables, if you like them, I would put them away, <laughs> right? You can explain to the aunt or, and you could probably do both, explain to your child, right? Tia Angelica, she loves her little, um, you know, uh, precious moments, right? She loves them. We cannot touch them. We are not touching them, right? So making rules. If we are close to the to the precious moments, we hold our hands like this, right? Um, or, you know, maybe all of them are in one room and you call but um, Atia and Helica and you say, can you lock the door to the room with your precious moments? I don't want them to get broken. I want this to be a good visit and I don't want you to be stressed out, right? So you're making it about, her a little bit, right? I want to protect your valuables. I want to protect what's important to you. Um, and that way, you know, maybe they go somewhere else. Um, I have also seen, so like, especially the Christmas tree, right? Breakable Christmas ornaments. I have seen people put baby gates around the Christmas tree. Only the Christmas tree. You put the baby gates around it and then you can't get to it right? So you could ask for that. Um, there are lots of ways to plan ahead. What we don't want is for you to walk in and to look around and there's tons of precious moments everywhere and your kid is just in them with their hands, 
right? Um, it's kind of, it's a little late at that point. So now what can you do while you are there? What can you do while you're there to support your child in making the bolos or the bolsas? Drinking my coffee. I can't see if anyone's typing. So Maria gave, oh, here we go. Yeah, keep your eyes on your child. Yes. Now, in a perfect world, Tia Angelica has said, oh, of course, I will put my precious moments away. Thank you so much for thinking of me. Yes, I will feel much better that knowing that they won't get broken. Okay, great. 10 out of 10. We love Tia Angelica. Yes, great. Now, when it comes to being there, yes, eyes on. Also, if you have a cousin, if there's a cousin that gets along really well with your child, you could delegate. You could give that responsibility to the cousin, right? You say, okay, you're going to sit next to cousin Angel, cousin Angel, and he is going to help you make the bolsas. And so um, Angel puts the peanuts in, hands it to your child, your child puts the tangerine in, and then your child hands it over to the person who puts the sugar cane in. Traditional, okay? So everyone is part of a line. They've got one cousin on one side, one cousin on the other side that can help them with the steps if they get confused or, you know, whatever. You can also set a timer. We're making bolsas for 10 minutes. Set your timer. They put in the oranges for 10 minutes. When the timer goes off, they are finished and they can go do something else. Okay, so think about it just like all of the tips that we've given you in all of our presentations, you can bring them in to these situations. Okay, and then what do we do after? So let's say your child does amazing. Everything goes perfect. You do not have to use your emergency word. The cousins help with the bolsas. Tia Angelica is so pleased that all the bolsas are made. Everyone is so happy reward your child. It doesn't have to be big, but say, wow, you did so amazing today. Why don't we go get a Wendy's milkshake or whatever they're, uh, uh, what do they call Frosty, a Wendy's Frosty. Why don't we go to Dairy Queen and get a shake? Why don't we go to the store and get you, or, or if you're really clever, you could have a special gift waiting at home or in the car if they do a good job, right? So again, telling them they've done well, telling them that you appreciate them, telling them that, that you are so proud of them can be really helpful as well. Okay, any questions about this scenario? Maria, have we gotten any questions? No, okay. And you can ask them and we can come back to them. So, all right. So next we have you and your family are going to Christmas or Hanukkah service at your church or synagogue on a different day than you normally do. So if you are Catholic, you probably go to church on Sundays and that is your routine. But sometimes, Christmas mass happens on days that are not Sunday. It's very common. So you're there at a different day and probably a different time than you would normally go. The service lasts for one hour and you know that your child sometimes has trouble sitting still, especially when it's not part of their routine. What could you do before you go to set your child up for success? So what are some ways you could help them be prepared for the time change and the day change? Yeah, 
making a social story, that's a great idea. So we go to church on Sundays, but during Christmas, we go on different days. This Christmas, we will go on Wednesday. Most of the time, we go to church at 8 a.m., but on Wednesday, we will go to church at, what, at 5 p.m. Absolutely, a social story, okay? What can you do while you are there? So if we know that the child has trouble sitting still, what are some things that we can do to help them to either stay in the service and to stay sitting still? Uh, I'm sorry, Maria, help me with this one. You tell them we're going to uh, the church. It says, I uh, let him know that we're going to the church today. Okay, perfect. Yes, let him know in advance. The other thing you could do is bring something small that doesn't make noise for the child to engage with while the church service is going on. So that could look like a small stuffed animal, um, something, a comfort item, right? That they could entertain themselves with during the service, okay? Um, you can also have them, um, you know, we, like we said with the emergency word where they could go into the separate viewing room um, if they need to, or you could have, you know, one family member go outside and have them, you know, run laps <laughs> around. Um, some places have a sanctuary area outside where you can just run to your heart's content and it's totally fine. And then you could switch off, right? So maybe one person is in and then you switch off and the other person comes out with the child. But again, you have to plan beforehand. You don't wanna be giving your husband or your wife the, the, the dagger eyes, you know? Um, you want to be able to tell them, I'm going out, come, come get me in five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever the situation. Okay. And then again, what can you do after? Same thing. We can reward for appropriate behavior, tell them we are proud of them, tell them that this is how it's going to be most Christmases and we'll be ready for next Christmas, whatever you need to say afterwards. I was just going to say that sometimes you can download a visual timer for your phone and let them see it so they know how much time is left that they have to sit. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay, so let's go to our scenario three. You and your family are going to another family's home. You don't know them well, but you know they're planning on buying a piñata for the children you know that they will also have lots of food, but you're not sure if your child will like what is served. What can you do to set your child up for success before you go over to these people's houses? Also, I think it's important to say that Being prepared to have the hard, con not hard conversations, but conversations with people about your child are really important. And the more comfortable you get having them, the easier they are. So, yep, bring my own food dish. That's exactly right. That will help, again, with being hungry and you don't have to have the awkward conversation, right, of what will the child eat. And then the hosts maybe feel bad that they didn't make the correct food for your child, right? Um, tell them that we're going to visit. Bring a snack. Yep. Ooh, yes. Ask for photos of the family that you're visiting before you visit. Yeah, call and say, hey, 
we're just trying to prepare our child. Could we get a family photo so that we can explain who everyone is and make it clear that we're coming over to their house? Yes, absolutely. That's a great idea. Um, now, the other thing to think about is the activities. We had two, two issues here, right? One is the food. We've got that sorted. Great. The other is the pinata. Have any of you ever seen a pinata go wrong? I have, okay, I have. Uh, you're letting children loose with a stick, with a blindfold on, and you're spinning them in circles beforehand. Almost certainly something is bound to go wrong. And I don't know if it was just my family, but we always had the uncle who would pull it so that it wouldn't get hit. And so you would swing and you would miss and you'd spin in circles, right? Maybe that was just my uncles. Maybe no one else's uncles do that. Um, but there's a lot that can happen with a pinata, right? So you need to decide, is my child going to sit out of the pinata this year? Is my child going to hit with a stick, but no blindfold and no spinning? Is my child going to only go in when the candy has fallen? What do what would set my child up for success, right? Because for some children, the scramble for the candy is the worst part. For some children, having a blindfold feels bad to them, right? They can't see, it feels, you know, and of course the blindfold is never soft. It's somebody's bandana from their back pocket, right? Over your eyes, okay? Um, or when you spin, sensory-wise, that could really make things feel strange. So deciding first what parts your child is going to participate in, and then communicating that with the host. Hi, my child has some sensory things and does not like to be touched, so asking them to go in and fight for candy is too much that will likely cause problems. So we're gonna have them sit out, but their siblings can get candy for them and we'll split the candy amongst the siblings, right? So coming to them with the solution rather than the problem, what you don't want is for you to get there and have to have the conversation with the host when they're like, oh, you take a turn. We want to include you, right? You want it to be less awkward and you don't wanna to have to have that conversation in the moment. You wanna do all of the educating before, just like Maria was saying. We don't wanna wait till the meltdown to do the education piece. We don't wanna wait until someone's holding the stick toward your child and trying to put a blindfold on their face before we have that conversation. We wanna do it way before, okay? And again, while you're there, that's the other ojos, right? You need to have eyes on the child because it sounds like there's gonna be a lot going on and we wanna make sure they're set up for success, okay? And again, you may have to advocate in the moment. Remember, Mrs. So-and-so, my child will not, my one child will not be participating in the pinata, right? Remember, I brought a dish so you don't need to make him a plate. I'll make him a plate of just his, for food that he likes, okay? So we can do that. And then same thing after, reward, reward, reward. You did amazing. You were so great with the pinata. Thank you for trying to hit it. You did great, right? You did a great job standing back because you didn't want to be touched. That's totally okay, right? So all of that can happen before, during, and after. It's important to have all three pieces. Otherwise, the child may, you know, maybe, I know some kids that hate parties. I know it's, it's hard to hear. It's, it's a little sacrilegious in, in the Hispanic culture, but some people do not like parties. And so having the reward at the end could help them to feel more positive about the parties that are happening next year, right? Yeah, it's hard for me when I'm at the party, but you know what? Last year, I got Legos afterwards. So I'm feeling pretty good about this party. It's all right by me, okay? So again, just things to consider before your next big event.
And we took some silly pictures and some serious pictures. <laughs> um, can you put the um, um, consumer satisfaction surveys and link to, into, into the chat? I surely can. And you want to talk a little bit about our future plans and things like that? Um, yeah, is that the last slide? I guess it is. Okay. Um, as I said, I don't know if we're going to get funded again. What we might do is do this quarterly instead of um, monthly. It's just going to, and only one, um, one per month. Um, but your feedback to ACDD may help us. <laughs> just saying. Um, we have, I just want you to know that we have thoroughly enjoyed doing this and um, for the two years we've been doing it. I've learned a lot and I, I, I was looking at who's here and I was thinking about our Korean interpreters and wondering, they probably could have given a whole nother presentation on, um, on, on holiday um, traditions in Korea that might be a little different or that. Yeah, so anyway, I, I just, uh, having lived in Germany for several years, it's just, those are things to be embraced. Thank you for the thumbs up. <laughs> and I just added the links. So we've got the YouTube link. Um, and then we have the survey English, then Spanish, then Korean. Um, and yeah, we're incredibly grateful to all of y'all, um, particularly our, um, I like to think of y'all as our regulars, our dependable reliables um, that show up every presentation, um, I have to say it makes it makes it feel like we're doing something important because y'all show up. Um, that that makes it feel real to us. Um, a lot of what I do in my research, I'm in my little office just typey typing. Um, but having these presentations reminds me that um, what we do matters and is important. Um, and what y'all do as parents matters and is so important. So I appreciate y'all continuing to show up for us and for the presentations and for the professionals that we bring, um, because it also fills them as well, fills their cup, right? Makes them um, feel important and valued. Um, and I know it may sound weird, <laughs> Um, as professionals saying, we don't always feel it, but it's true. Um, we spend a lot of time looking at computers and not talking to people. So this is really great to have all of y'all here. Um, and I feel like some of y'all I've developed relationships with outside of the presentations. Um, and we're just really grateful for y'all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Drew and uh, Dr. Hale. Hale. Of the sexuality. Uh, presentation 28 February did you say or 20 21st 21 February is our next one mm -hmm. and that's going to be a reboot of the sexuality and disability just in time around the time of Valentine's Day and Dr. Hill there were some questions that I sent you previously uh they're on the chat box they were sent directly to you if you want to address them I think that Dr. Drew covered hers because uh, you were asking them at me so there are probably like four questions i believe but i'm not seeing them i see thank you um oh okay, it says, I, I never thought about facial cards to help my child that's a good idea how old is too old to learn social i'm still learning social skills um every environment's a little bit different and you have to under you know to learn to read the room i guess you would say um how old is uh, and I, I, I was going to, there was a video I really like, it's called, um, it's in Auburn, they call it Shine Prom, but it's it's a prom for kids with special needs. And the thing is, is that the more you can involve um, your child in activities like that, in, in this one, it shows how they were, they had actually a lot of help. And in the end, the kids really enjoyed the prom, they danced with people, they um, listened to the music. Um, but the, the thing is, is that could generalize to quinceanera parties, to, um, to birthday parties, to uh, activities at school. So um, the more they can practice 
the easier it would be to generalize. So I think we learn social skills our whole life. Uh, my child is getting to be a young man and he has no understanding of greeting people or being socially appropriate. Um, uh, it, depending on your, you know, on your insurance, and we do have supports for Medicaid now, um, if your child has autism, then there's always behavior therapy, working with a therapist. Did you want to address that one too, either of you? And the school. So you and can advocate for the school teaching social skills, um, because if it's affecting their life at school, which it will be, um, then that would be something that they can address and have a goal and teach it just like they teach anything else. So I would say that's another thing you could advocate for being added to the IEP, um, just like you would add, you know, um, math or um you know, toothbrushing or, you know, potty training, right? You can add any of that to the IEP so that it's addressed with peers um, and with strangers, right? There's always new people in a school building to meet. Um, so they could definitely practice that. Uh, it says, is the peers program offered at other places? Uh, they do it in Birmingham. Um, it's offered through Lakeshore. UAB also does um, the peers program and um, connections, which is a social skills program leading to employment for young adults or adolescents. They've also done that in Montgomery. So the best thing to do is to email and we can send you some links um, to those other locations. And um, this says, Escuches, is that to listen? Mm -hmm. There's a question about listening. Um, something about, well, the, did you see that one? Did you answer that one? Yes, that was was answered. Now, um, the one's one that says, can the school work in helping my child with social skills? How can I bring it up in a meeting? Uh, talk to the teacher and say you would like to have this added to the IEP. That's the first line of resource. And then if that teacher um, is, I don't want to say, that teacher should be able to um, include that because they're the ones that develop the IEP pages. And so they could, they could place that onto the IEP. Does that make and, sense? And then BCBAs can also be brought in to do social skills instruction. So you could ask for a BCBA to come because the lack of social skills can also lead to behavioral challenges. So, you know, someone bumps into them and they don't know how to react. That's a social skill um, and can be addressed from, you know, a challenging behavior or problem behavior perspective. And you could teach them how to say, you know, that's not cool, man. Or I don't and, like that. And you could, you could bring it up that without the social skills that leads to a problem with getting a job, uh, a problem with becoming arrested because you don't know how to, because we got the school resource officer. And if, if that child gets all upset and escalates because they got bumped in the hallway, it could get out of control. And I think we've seen that in the mm -hmm. news at a time or two. So yeah, the thing is to ask, and I would start with the teacher. And the last one, I think, is just a comment. It says, my child loves the stories we write for him. I learned that from you in one of the presentations. Thank you. So um, that's As I said, there's a, there's a nice video. It's, it was long, so we, we skipped over it. But they talk about how to build your own social stories. So... So I want to say that we have learned a lot about social skills and you, what we envisioned with this uh, training today was to have the uh, educational component and then some scenarios and kind of mix it with the holidays and the traditions and the importance uh, for traditions in, our, in the Hispanic population. So I want to say that we appreciate it so much that you guys have stick with us for almost two hours. I cannot believe it, um, but we appreciate it. And, and also you guys will be receiving the PowerPoint in English and Spanish to the people that register in the link of the presentation as well. 
Um, Dr. Hill, is there anything else that you would like to say, Dr. Drew? Uh, no, thank y'all. We appreciate you. And thanks to our interpreters, as always, that do such amazing work. Uh, I would like to stop the recording. So. Um,